Lord, amen. There is no shadow that has ever overcome your life, and there is no rival that could ever stand against your mind. You've always There is no army Come on, that has ever That has ever left a mark on you There is no army With the power to conquer truth You've always been with us Every battle you've already won We've already won Come on, church, let's declare today Show me one thing he can do show me a mountain he can move he's the god of the breakthrough and anything is possible show me one thing that's too hard show me waters he can walk. he's the god of the breakthrough and anything is possible There is a kingdom that's advancing at the speed of light. And in this kingdom, every dead thing is bound to lie. Oh God, our Redeemer, He is faithful to revive. Oh, He will revive. Show me a mountain he can move. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me what is he can move. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. It's possible. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all of be. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise.
holding on to faith Cause I know you'll make a way And I don't always understand And I don't always get to see But I will believe it Yes, I will believe it Is you make mountains move you make giants fall. You use songs of praise to shake prison walls. And I will speak to my fear. I will preach to my doubt that you were faithful then. You'll be faithful now. Oh, man. 
all put your hands together if you're glad of that man what a great weekend last weekend as we celebrated a night of worship and baptism as some of those honored God and uh, followed him in that disciple process you saw some of the faces that got baptized Byron who was the last I think he was the last gentleman you saw on that uh, on that photo there he his family's been praying for him a sister and a brother-in-law and a brother's been praying for a while he's dedicated his life to Christ well, he was so excited to get in the baptism pool, he forgot to take his hearing aids out. Yeah, right? Yeah. So he gets baptized, and then he's like, oh, snap, my hearing aids. Well, they gathered around him and prayed, said, God, listen, just touch his hearing aids, right? Hey, we'll pray for anything. Touch his hearing aids. Make sure they, uh, you know, they, they, they don't mess up or, and, and keep going. Well, guess what? They've been working all week. He hadn't had a single issue with it. Come on, for legit, Joe. We'll pray for hearing aids at Heartland. We don't care. So it's just cool, man, to see God uh, just doing some amazing things. The last Sunday night, last Sunday, there were salvations that happened with our guest speaker, Bruce. And uh, so just so many great things going on here at Heartland. Uh, and so we want to make you aware. I want you to get your offering ready. So we're going to get ready and take that in just a minute. Make you aware of a couple of things. If you're a first-time guest today, met some in the first service this morning. But I want you to take that card out right now. It's in the seat in front of you. Just fill it out. Just takes a few seconds just to let us know you are here. We can connect with you after service and uh, give you a free gift. Or if you like technology better and your cell phones are much easier, just text the word Valpo to 219-600-4881. Uh, you can do that online as well. For If you're watching for the first time, we want to connect with you as well and, uh, and just uh, let you know more about Heartland. Hey, and just uh, next Sunday, in just seven days, we have our one day, our Convoy of Hope, one day to feed the world offering and we want to challenge you as you go out today 
Uh, many of you probably gab, uh, grabbed one of these envelopes as you came in today. But as you go out, make sure you grab one of these. But also there's a little yellow sticker there that says one day. Then we want to challenge you this week as you're working uh, at work to choose a day to uh, work and let that day's wage. That's what one day to feed the world is all about is take you take a day's wage. So if you take an hourly, if you have an hourly job, uh, compute what you would make that hour. If you're on salary, compute what you would make that day, right? And take that day's wage. Wear that sticker as a sign to show your coworkers, people around you, right, that, uh, hey, I'm working today, one day to feed the world. And the next Sunday when you come, we're going to take up our special offering. We network with Convoy of Hope on a lot of different things. One day to feed the world is it a great uh, way that we like to be a part of of things going on because 99.99% of this money uh, that we will take in our One Day to Feed the World offering will go directly uh, to feed people all over this all over this world. Does it go to staff? Does it go to budgets? It goes directly to feed kids and families. And what we love about uh, One Day to Feed the World is your $1 because of partnerships with corporations and foundations and businesses, your $1 becomes $7. So next Sunday, when you give $100 to Convoy of Hope, that becomes $700. You give $1,000 to Convoy of Hope, that becomes $7,000. You give $10,000, becomes $70,000. You see how the math works, right? So we challenge you to do that uh, next Sunday with us. And also in two weeks, uh, on November the 6th, I cannot believe November is two weeks away, y'all. Christmas Eve is, means it's like, right around the corner. Lord, Jesus, help me. Uh, in two weeks, though, we celebrate 74 years as a church. Uh, come on, that's exciting, right? 74 years um, as a church. We celebrate 22 years of our lead pastor and Miss Rhonda, 22 years. And not only, they will be celebrating their 50th year in ministry. 50 years in ministry, y'all. And I know you're thinking, well, Miss Rhonda doesn't look a day over 35. I know she does not. But 50 years in ministry is what they'll be celebrating. So on November 6th, you've received an email. Hopefully you have. If you haven't, well, that's because we need your information. It goes back to the Connect card. Uh, we'll let you know. We, we told you how we're going to honor them on November 6th. And so we just advise you uh, to do just that. Hey, I want you to stand this morning um, as we get ready to honor God in our tithe and offering. And uh, we want to thank you this morning for those watching online. You're getting ready to click that uh, I gave button. And if you're giving digitally today, maybe you give through the app or you give online, I want you to grab that I gave card in your seat in front of you. I, I love to give through the app. I don't give by check or cash anymore. I love to use our app. But if you're giving digitally, I want you to participate with us today as well. And listen, we just thank you for your stewardship. We talk a lot about Heartland of how do we steward, right? Not just our treasure, that's part of it, our tithe. But how do we, how do we steward our time, our temple, our talent, our treasure, our testimony, right? And, and listen, now when we give to God, it's not because we're giving to a person and, or a building. It's not even because we're giving something that we have. You do understand stewardship is just simply about giving back to God what's already His. Amen? What he's already entrusted us with, what he's always already blessed us with, we're just simply returning back to him as a good steward. So I want you to take your offering in your hand this morning, that I gave card. You're getting ready to click online, and I want to pray for you. God, I thank you, Lord, for men and women all across this room, God, that is expanding your kingdom, not because of one person and not because of a church, but God, because of men and women all across this place that are world changers. And so, God, today as we give to you, as we honor you, as we steward back to you what's already yours, God, we're sowing into ground this morning. We're putting seed into your, into your ground, into your kingdom. And I pray that you would bless them, God. Lord, there's financial, Lord, spiritual, emotional, physical, Lord, mental miracles need to happen in this place. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would just prove yourself true to your word. Lord, that you would open the windows of heaven and bless them, God, as they, as they honor you today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Come on, I want you to come and give today. As you give, we got a special solo song by Miss Faith today. So I want you to come, bring your offering down, then I want you to sit down and, and check out Miss Faith. What do I gain if I win the whole but wake up to find that I've lost my soul. I thought I'd find myself. But something was missing. It's not what I wanted. I didn't have to look high or look low. Your love meant me when I 
began to let go. You show me a new way. When nothing is missing and you're all I wanted, you stepped right into my story and show me there's a better me. forgiving it but I'm gonna love you with all of my heart. don't want it any other way it's more than a feeling and you are the real real thing you stepped right into my story and show me there's a better voice, I would have turned my chair around the first time. Come on. If we was on America's Idol, I would have given her the golden buzzer. She'd be going all the way. I didn't, I didn't know whether to get out there. I wanted to dance. I don't even slow dance, and I felt like that might be a I don't know, man. Awesome. Faith is only 11 years old. Isn't she amazing? It's just <laughs> she, we, we have such talented uh, youth, and uh, you know, it's just amazing to our church and what God is doing. It's a little bit of rumble up here, uh, Aaron, on the, on the monitors. But hey, I want you to grab your worship guide this morning and open your Bibles if you have them with you to Luke chapter 18. There's going to be some verses up on the screen. We're going to welcome all of our online audience, our North Judson, Wadita, Hebron, Westfield, and NPA. Come on, would you give all of our online campuses a good welcome? And uh, hey, also, we have the patriarch of the Willingham family. I have my 88-year-old mother that's in church with me today. Mom, mom, wave at us a little bit. Here she is. Come on, let's see. There we go. Hey, man, uh, we went to Alabama, picked her up. She's going to hang out here. She said, I, I hope I see some smell. I said, Mom, you do know you'll get hurt if you say that around here. People don't want snow, but she... Uh, she was great. Hey, we've been in this conversation all this month just about the word ambition, and uh, we've been having a conversation about what does that look like in our life, and 
How do we go after the things in our life? And we've had kind of a working definition that we've been working off of is ambition is that earnest desire for some type of achievement or distinction, things like power, honor, fame, or wealth. You have that earnest desire, and there's a willingness to strive for its attainment. In other words, you, you have this desire, you got this, you got this drive, you got this push about you, and you have to have the willingness to go after that. You want to strive for that. You want to attain after that. And what we've discovered in our conversation is just simply the Bible teaches us that ambition is amoral. It, it's not immoral. It's not moral. It's amoral. It's like money. Ambition can be good or ambition can be bad. Come on, how many understand that? It's like, a, it's like money. Money is a tool. Ambition can be a tool for us to be used for a godly purpose or for a worldly pur purpose or for a selfish purpose. And uh, what we've discovered in this conversation is that it's the eternal motivation, the internal motivation behind our ambition that will determine whether or not we have godly ambition or whether we have selfish ambition. And uh, the question that we've just been simply asking and kind of getting people, getting us to think about is, well, what is your greatest ambition? Well, what is the thing in your life that, that drives you or compels you to do the things that you do? Just think about that for a moment. If, if, if everything is stripped away from your life, what's the one thing that you want most in your life? And how many understand that's a good question? You, you talk to people today, and, and a lot of people say, well, you know, particularly young people, they say, well, you know, my, my ambition is to, is to go to college, and uh, my ambition is to finish school. People, people say, my ambition is to get married. You know, back, back in 1973, I'm 18 years old. My greatest ambition at 18 was, Lord Jesus, do not come before I get married. I mean... That was my greatest prayer. I'm praying, Lord, because everybody was saying Jesus was coming in 77 or 1980, and uh, Ron and I got married in 1974. So at, at 18, at 1973, I'm praying, Lord Jesus, do not come. Now it's 48 years later, and I pray, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Come. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't do that. No, I don't. Rhonda told somebody after the first service, said, what do you say about when he prays prayers like that? She said, I simply tell him, if he really wants to go to meet Jesus, I can help him out, okay? And I believe that's probably true, so I'm going to behave myself with that. But, but you know, people have those ambitions. What, what is, some people have the ambition to have a great career. I, I want to I have a financial stability. All of those are noble ambitions. There, there was a French filmmaker in 1960s when he was asked that question, what's your greatest ambition? He simply says, I want to become immortal, and then I want to die. In other words, he said, I, I want to have a lasting impact on people. I want people to remember me. I want to be distinct in some way, fashion, and form. And most all of us, we have this desire. We want to be remembered, don't we? We, we talked about a couple weeks ago, it isn't about having a greater lifestyle, it's about how do we have a greater legacy in our life. I was reading just a few weeks ago in just a simple study that if, uh, uh, 20 years ago, most people would be remembered up to four generations. In other words, for 20 years ago, most people knew who their parents was, grandparents was, great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents. As of 2021, it is said now that most of us will only be remembered in two generations. Within two generations, you are forgotten about. Now, listen, I hope that ain't too morbid or sick or sad for you, but it's a fact of life. People don't get buried in the same cemeteries like they used to. The, the whole idea that our whole family is buried here is out of the water. You know, cremation come along now. Now people are everywhere. You know, they just, uh, it's just a part of the culture we live in. And, but generationally speaking, we only remember about two generations. We have to work hard to start building a legacy in our lives. So, so what, what we're talking about in this series this month is just simply, what, what is your greatest ambition? Is it a godly ambition or is it a selfish ambition? 
You know, for years I've carried this little card in my pocket, carried in my billfold, and uh, I just took a photo of that. Now that's back when I was just I was on the the uh, set of Cold Stone movie, and uh, I was just taking a break. But some of you don't even know what that is. But for years I've carried this little card in my in my pocket. You know what I want written on my tombstone? What is it about? What well, is about legacy? It's about what, what, do I, what do I spend my life focusing on? And I, I wrote these six things. Uh, it's been over, over 40 years ago now. I want to be faithful to my God. I want to be truthful to myself. I want to be loving to my family. I want to be a, a steward of my gifts. I want to be loyal to my friends. And I want to be genuine to everybody who knows me. And, and those are the things that I've kind of had as my goal. Those are the things that I... I get up every day and they say, okay, okay, Phil, what, what are you trying to accomplish today? I know I got a schedule. I know I got things to do. I got meetings to have. Will I be faithful to my God today? Will I be truthful to myself? How many understands the, the biggest person that most of us lie to is lie to ourselves? Hello? And the sad thing about it is when we start believing our lies, <laughs> we convince ourselves in our heart Things that our mind is telling us, even though our heart tells us it's wrong, if you start believing those lies in your head, eventually they get transmitted to your heart and you believe that lie. But those are things that I just, I just carried over the line. What is that? It's, it's simply an ambition. It, it's something that occupies my mind, my thought process of what I'm doing and how I'm living my life. And, and the thing about ambition, whether it's going to be godly or or whether it's going to be selfish ambition, is going to be determined by, does it have eternal value to it? Is eternity going to be impacted with that? Remember, when, when Christ said in Matthew 6 and 33, he said, listen, all these things that you're going after in this world, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and my, his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. In other words, I told you out of Genesis that God has put inside of us. He breathed in us. He created with us. We are a bundle of appetites. We, God, God put ambition inside of us. And what you and I have to do is we have to make sure that we're pursuing the things of God. How many understand? We have to make sure that we're putting God. Because if we put God first, if we seek first his kingdom, all these other things will be added in our life. Now, everybody look at somebody and say, well, that sounds simple. Well, it sounds simple, but how many understand what sounds simple sometimes is difficult, right? Come on, everybody say it's difficult. And, and what we've been looking at and what I want to kind of look at today is the, simply the fact of what it looks like to just simply pursue the things in order that we can seek the things of God. Because so many things in our life, when, when they get misunderstood or misapplied, they lead us astray. They, they lead us down a path that we seek things of this world to fill a hole in our hearts that only God can fill for us. In the end, in, in the end, when everything's said and done, there's really only two uh, kinds of ambition. It's, it's God's ambition and it's selfish ambition. We're either going to seek the things of God or we're going to go after self. And self comes in with the world. Paul writes this in Philippians 2 and 3. He said, do nothing out of selfish ambition. He didn't say do nothing out of ambition. He's, God's not against that. He said, do nothing out of self and of ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others in your relationship with one another. And what's it? Have the same mindset. Another translation of the Greek word there is have the same ambition as Jesus. And what's it? Paul makes a distinction that we can live for our ambition or we can live for God's ambition. We can, we can live for success, for our success, or we can live for God's success. We, we can't do both. And he compares... What, what he's saying with our personal ambitions, that, that, that selfish ambition, it comes out of those, those things in our life that ends up being conceited. But he said also, you, you can have the mindset of Jesus Christ. You can have the mindset of what, how Jesus operated his life. Now, most of us understand the fact that Jesus should be our ultimate example, right? 
He should be the one that we're, we're following. He's our mentor. Now, now, we say, well, Pastor Phil, I could never be another Jesus. I'm not saying to be in another Jesus. The Bible says we're supposed to be like Jesus. We're supposed to follow his footsteps. We're supposed to have the same mindset or have the same mindset or ambition as Jesus Christ. Jesus said this in Mark 8 and 36. He said, what is it going to profit a man if you gain the whole world, but you forfeit his own self? I mean, what do you get? When, when, and here's the thing about it. When you get what you wanted, do you want what you got? Okay? When, 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 you, when you go after what you want to go after and you finally get what you wanted, are you satisfied with what you got? Here's the thing about it. We have a culture today that when people get what they wanted, they don't want what they got. They're, they're never satisfied. How many understand that? Godly ambition requires, and what's it? It requires both hustle and humility. It requires hustle and humility. There's a lot of people, they say, well, you know, if God, God wants me to have this, if the Lord wants to bless me, and, and you know, if the Lord wants our church to grow, you know, he'll, here we are, Lord, send them in. And, and, you know, if the Lord wants me to, you know, have more money, then, then, then he'll just give it to me. No, no, no. Godly ambition requires that you have hustle along with humility. The problem gets in is when we pursue one without the other. We're hustling, we're going after, we're pursuing, but we don't have humility. We don't understand that everything we have, everything that we get, ultimately comes from the Father above. So we hustle and we think, how? Hey, this is mine, this is what I have. No, you don't. It's God's. And he's just blessed you that he just loaned that with you. So I want to go this morning in this conversation in Luke chapter 18. And I want to have a conversation with you about this young rich ruler that Jesus has an encounter with. There, there are several verses here and I just want to read them. And I just want to navigate this conversation. A couple of weeks ago we had a dad talk and we just kind of talked to you as a dad. But today just want to come along beside us, and I want us to say, listen, let, let's just look at our life. Listen, somehow or another, we've got to stop thinking that you have a spiritual life, you have a business life, you, you, you have a church life, you have a family. No, no, you, listen, you have one life, okay? Stop asking people, how's your spiritual life going? You only have one life, okay? Now, out of that life, we have those categories in which we build our life. They're, they're the spiritual side, when we say that, what we're talking about is, how was our communication with Father? How, how's our prayer life? How's our Bible study? All of that. But listen, we have just one life. I don't have a family life and a church life. I got one life. You understand that? And it flows together. So all of my ambitions that I have in this area, they're going to affect every area of my life. Am I making sense yet? You can't separate your ambition. Your ambitions are either going to be godly or they're going to be selfish. And what we have to do is to make sure that the intent of our hearts stay pure so the fact that what we pursue, we pursue because we understand it is God that's calling us to pursue those things. And when we have blessings in our life, when we see the favor of God, when we see the prosperity of the Father, when we see God doing great things in our life, our family, whatever it is, we ultimately come back and we reflect all the glory and the praise back to Him. It is never, oh, look what I have. Look what I've accomplished. So in Luke chapter 18, a certain ruler, one, one translation, young rich ruler, Ask him, talking about Jesus, this is a good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Everybody say, good question. Good question. Why, why, why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. All of these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Now, now look at your neighbor and say, he is so close. Come on. So, so, come on, tell him. Tell him. Do, do that. Do that right there. Come on. He is so You just lack one thing. Now, it is amazing. I don't know about you. 
when I go to God, I've never had God tell me, hey, Phil, buddy, you're just almost there. My list seems to be always long. Now, that's just me. I know you're probably closer to him than I am, but that's just me. But this guy comes to Jesus. He recognizes. He's, Jesus said, you like one thing, sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for someone who is rich in, in, to enter the kingdom of heaven. Then, then those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? So watch this. This story, he, we, we got this young, rich ruler. So what's that? She, he's young, he, he's got possessions, and he's got prestige. He's young, he's rich, and he's prestigious. He comes to Jesus, and he's, he's in this vicious cycle of ambition and success. I mean, he's pursuing success. He, uh, he has the image. I think everything about this story tells us that this young, rich ruler... The Bible gives specific things like that for a reason. Riches only come because of hard work. Either he's been a hard worker or the generation before him was a hard worker and they got handed down. You don't get just rich by, by accident. Somebody paid a price for riches. Somebody said, well, what if I win the Powerball? Well, all those poor people who's paid in, that's another message. I'm not going to go there, but listen. This guy has everything about him. He'd be on the cover of the the magazine, you know, GQ. You know, he he's probably wearing Gucci sandals. You know, he he has power lunch at Jerusalem Athletic Club. He drives a sport chariot. Lives in the penthouse overlooking the temple. Everything about this guy says he he has got what he wanted. People, people wanted to be him. People wanted to be like him. But something is missing. He's running on empty. All this pursuit, all these wrong ambitions, everything that he's he's been going after has left him wanting more. So when he finds out Jesus is in town, this young man comes to Jesus looking for answers. He's wealthy, but he's not secure. Listen, how many understand wealth doesn't give you security? You're fooling yourself if you think if I just had more money, I'd be better secure. No, no, no. When the stock market did what it did a few weeks ago, a few days ago, there was people, they were in panic because they lost thousands upon thousands of dollars. Overnight, it can be gone. Wealth doesn't give us security. He's wealthy, but he's not secure. He, he has some type of religious content to him, but he's not righteous. He's good, but he's not godly. Something is missing in this young guy's life. He's running on empty. He comes kneeling down to Jesus, and he shows that he has this, this, this honorable attitude when he says, good teacher. And the Bible teaches us that that Jesus will will, will look at him, and Jesus will will, will have a conversation. Now watch this. There's so many things working in his favor. He's running. He's kneeling. He gives gives tribute to who Jesus is. He He asks a crucial question. When was the last time you had somebody come up to you and said, listen, I'm in a hurry right now, but can you tell me what can I do to inherit eternal life? He asked the right question. At least partial of it, we'll learn where he messed up in that question. And, and he gets informed by the commandments, and he says, listen, dude, man, I've been, I've been hanging out on those commandments thing. I got, an, I got an A plus on those things. Are you with me? So what's this? And when, when Jesus starts having this conversation with him, there's three things we pick up on this. And I want to I get you through this, and then we're going to, we're going to learn how do, we, how do we keep bringing our ambitions back to God to make sure we don't get off track. The first one, write this down. We have to avoid the performance illusion. 
Performance illusion simply gives us the idea that our value as a person is based upon somehow or another our success or what we achieve or what we accomplish. Our, our performance illusion is, is, is the mindset of, of Vince Lombardi. With, we, you know, the, the mindset that, that winning isn't everything. Winning is the only thing, okay? You meet people like that today? I don't care what it has to take. I don't care what I have to sacrifice. I don't care who I run over. I got to be number one. The, 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 when you read this story, it seems like his entire sense of self-worth is measured by what he's doing. So he asked the question, what should I do? Listen, I feel like I'm missing something, but, and so it's got to be something that I can do to get this emptiness filled up in my life. How many people run the gamut of that same story? Well, what do I, I, I want to run, I, maybe I need to do this. And again, you get what you want, you don't want what you got. So maybe I need to do this. So you run over here and you do this and you get what you want, you don't want what you got. You keep doing, doing. And listen, what, what this guy, he was so accustomed to doing that he had no clue that his life is undone. He banked his entire identity on performance. Now, I don't know whether he had been taught this or whether or not he just kind of processed this in his own mind. But his value as a person was on what he could do, what he could perform, rather than his connection to Jesus Christ. And he was taking, he was doing everything he could to take matters in his hand to make a name for himself. And he had a name. He was a young, rich ruler. He was notorious, known in the city. He was rich. He was young. I mean, I don't, he might have been single, so I guarantee you every woman in Jerusalem would have been if I could lock onto this dude. He had the name of that. But listen, he, he had this misplaced and misapplied ambition. And when that happens in our life, it causes us to go after our will at the expense of ignoring, ignoring God's will in our life. So Jesus notices this. Now, which he didn't kick him to the curb. He didn't say, get away from me, you sinful man. He loves this dude. He loves him. Because he knows there's something going on in his life, but he's missing something. He's, he's got something going on here, his head, but he doesn't have it happening in his heart yet. Are you with me? He's got that 18 inches to travel from. And Jesus is going to try to help him. He says in verse 19 and 20, uh, he said, well, you know, the, you, you, why do you call me good? And he said, well, no one is good except God. In other words, he recognizes there's some deity about Jesus. And Jesus said, you know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't, don't murder. Don't steal. Don't accuse. Uh, you know, re respect your mother and father. And he said, listen, I've obeyed all these things for my youth. Listen, J Jesus gives this guy a pop quiz on the top ten commandments, except he leaves out commandment 1 through 4, or, or commandment 10, he only asked him about relationship command. All the commandments Jesus is talking to him about, adultery, false, uh, false, uh, 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 false witness, um, all those things have to do with your relationship with people. Why? Jesus knows he's caught up on what people think about him. He's caught up on performance. And listen, he's good at making think that, making everybody think he's got it all going. Because look at me. Listen, I'm the, I'm the kind of guy, I don't never commit an adultery. I've never murdered nobody. I don't steal. I don't accuse anybody. I respect my father. Hey, just look at me. Jesus doesn't ask him about no other gods or no idols or remember the Sabbath or don't covet. Why? Because this guy is so caught up on the external, and Jesus is trying to get him to understand that even if you look at your performance, you can never do anything to inherit eternal life. Right. What can I do, Pastor? Listen, you can't do anything. Stop it. You can't earn it. You, 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 listen, you can't try to add goodness to your scale to somehow or another you could outweighs your bad. How many people we know in this world think that's how now they're going to get to heaven one day? Well, I'm just, I'm just hoping my good is going to outweigh my bad. Performance-based mentality. Listen, he had the wrong ambition and he was so cued in on outward performance and accomplishment 
This guy thought that his deeds, his behavior were good enough to earn God's favor for approval. He thought that somehow or another God was going to applaud him for his goodness. But he didn't understand that his earthly significance and eternal destiny are, is never linked to performance. That's why so many people think that their good deeds is going to save them and keep them secure. The Bible plainly tells us it's not going to happen. It's only by God's grace that we can come. It's the reason why when we talk about ambitions, we, we talk about these, 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 these bundle of appetites that God puts inside of us. Again, they're never there for us to try to perform, to do something that somehow or another that God is going to say, oh, look what you've done. Now you've done all of this. And oh, I just, I just want you to come on to heaven because you're good. You're such a great performer. We're not God's circus animals. Hello? We're his kids. He loves us, and he sent his son to die on a cross for us. So Jesus says, listen, dude, you've got to avoid this performance mentality. Secondly, we have to avoid the possession confusion. Because the possession, possession confusion has the idea that, again, we are are we valued as a person based upon the stuff that we have, the labels on our clothes, the houses we live in, the cars we drive, the money we bank, the trophies that we collect, all the dust on, this on our shelves. And listen, don't just think it's the young people to do that. It's our senior adults, we're just as bad. We think that somehow or another that, that, you know, our possession and what people see us with, what they see us driving, you know, it's like this 92-year-old guy, you know, he, he was uh, out with it, this very attractive lady on his arm, and he runs into his doctor, and, he, and his doctor looked at him and said, man, said, what in the world is going on? He said, no, he said, thanks, doctor. He said, listen, I feel so much better since you gave me the advice that you gave me. The, guy, the doctor looked at him and said, what do you mean, what advice? And the, the man looked at his, uh, his doctor and said, listen, you told me a few weeks ago that I need to get me a hot mama and be cheerful. The doctor said, no, I didn't say get a hot mama and be cheerful. I said, you got a heart murmur, be careful. But li- listen, his significance is based upon who he had on his arm. I know we laugh at that, but how many people do we know today that think that that's where their, 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 their significance as a person, what car you drive in, what house you live, what subdivision do you own, what job do you have, how much money do you make, da, da, da. Come on, we, well, listen, this world is, is simply caught up into that stuff. And this is a guy that somehow or another considered himself better than others because an outward performance mentality, I've been keeping all these commandments, and oh, by the way, I've got all this stuff. So Jesus said, okay, are you ready? Now watch it. Jesus, Jesus is loving this dude. He's having this conversation. He hasn't kicked him to the curb. He hasn't said, get away from me, you sinful man. Verse 22, that Jesus looked at him. Mark's account of this in Mark chapter 10, Jesus loved him and he said, one thing you lack, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. What do I need to do to have eternal life? Oh, you want performance? You're you're really caught up into that. You want to stay on that, 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 that track? Okay, you just lack... You're this close. Just go sell everything you got. Give it away. Come follow me. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus gave him the answer. Right? He gave him the answer. Oh, I just tell you what, this religion and salvation stuff, it's such a mystery. You know, I wish we really knew. We can know. This guy knows what to do. Jesus just told him. Well, what does the rest of that verse say? At this, at this, the man's face fell. Now, when I read that, I'm thinking that he had an eye lift or a nose lift, and it just, all the, the stuff just come out, and maybe he wasn't quite as young as he thought he was. <laughs> Hello. That's another whole message. I understand. But listen, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, a better translation, the Greek word there said, is the same word 
that Matthew uses when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and the Bible says that Jesus was grieved. So Jesus issued a challenge to this, to this guy that, you know, you've been telling me all this stuff with your head. Let's just talk about your heart. The thing is, now listen, G- Jesus not for one second is saying that God's favor is based upon this man's poverty, okay? He's not trying to make him poor. Oh, I've, listen, believe me, I've heard pastors use that for years ago. They use, oh, you know, you can't have nothing. And, you know, God wants to, Lord, keep us poor. We'll, we'll stay humble. Listen, I can be humble and have $100 in my bank account. I'm okay, okay? But listen, Jesus isn't trying to say that God's favor is attached to poverty. He's trying to move this man to face reality. Where are you putting your trust? You follow me? Where, who are you really trusting? Are you trusting in me, God? Are you trusting in the one that you said you acknowledge me? You come to me. You've asked me the question, or do, are you really trusting in your stuff? The man, the Bible said he was grieved. You know why? Jesus was grieved because he couldn't stand the thought of being separated from his father. He was grieved in his spirit because he knew what the cross would do. He knew that for a moment that God would would have to separate himself from his son as he allowed him to die. And listen, Jesus was grieved because he knew he would be separated from his father. This man is grieved because he's going to be separated from his stuff. You with me? His stuff, his stuff is what he really worshiped. His stuff is what he really tied his identity to. So the Bible says he walks away. He leaves. That's too, whoa, it's too hard. We see so many people that make the American ambition to pursue and go after things to the point that we sacrifice our relationship with God the Father. My mom's 88 years old, and you know what I love? One thing about my love, I love a lot about my mom, but one thing I love about my mom, she's 88 years old, she still loves to go to church. She still loves to go to church. I asked her last night, I said, Mom, you know, we have two services, it's kind of a long day. Oh, no, no, I want to go to both services. I want to see how bad you mess up in the first one that can tell about the second. No, I'm just, uh, she didn't say that. She, she, she loves her boys. She never sees anything we do wrong. But what I love the fact is that she loves, she loves the church. We, we're so blessed in this church right here. We've got young families. We've got babies popping out everywhere. I mean, we've we got showers of blessings. of children. But you know what I love about our young people? They're bringing their babies to church because they want their babies to love the church. They want their babies to grow up and love God the way they love God. Jesus said this, and he said this in, back in Luke 12. He said, watch out and guard yourselves from every kind of greed because your true life is not made up of the things you own, no matter how rich you may be. What does this lesson tell? Listen, we have, to, we, we have to be careful that we avoid the performance mindset, the possession mindset. We have to guard our hearts. And lastly, we have to accept God's personal solution. Jesus goes in this whole conversation about it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than than it is for a rich man in the heaven. And the people answered in verse 26, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, well, what is it? Humanly impossible is possible for God. He isn't saying rich people can't go to heaven. He simply says that man's way and God's way is not the same. Man's way always leaves an empty hole. It leaves a void. It leaves something missing in your life. And he's simply saying we have to stop pursuing independence from God. We have to exchange our independence from from him to our dependence to him. We have to be willing to trust and follow him with all of our hearts. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a knee. Now, there's all kinds of, of things about that, but there is some theological agreement that Jesus is talking about a metaphor here 
to the point that at night, in order to get into the city, the city gates was closed, but there was an opening that you could still get into the city. But as you could go in, your camel with all the things on the camel, all the treasures, your luggage, in order for the camel to get down and go through, you had to unload the camel. You had to strip everything off and coach that camel through the opening. And the metaphor Jesus is saying, listen, it's, it's not impossible. It, what's, what's impossible with men is totally possible. But, but in order for people who are trusting in stuff, in order for people who are trusting in things, in order for people who have put their hope in this stuff, you have to be willing to unload that stuff off of you, and you have to be coached into this. Come on. It's worth it. Come on. Lay it down. Get it off of you. We know that's a reality in our lives. Most of us, we don't mean for it to happen. But all of a sudden, stuff gets attached to us and on us and our mind so that when we do show up and we are in church, our minds are already at our job. We're trying to figure out how we're going to pay this bill or what we're going to do with that. And in order to enjoy the service and enjoy what God is doing, you have to be willing to unload that stuff and you say, time out, God. I need to be reminded today of who I'm trusting in. You follow me? Jesus said, or Paul said this in Colossians 3 and 17, and everything you do in word and deed, do it for the glory of God. Again, God, God isn't against you having ambition. He isn't trying to make you less ambition, but he's just simply saying, our ambitions, listen, whatever we do, do it for the glory of God. Listen, our ambitions for God should never be modest. There's something wrong. I think it's inappropriate for you and I to cherish small ambitions when we're kids of the Heavenly Father. Tommy Barnett, it says, and you, you might have heard him this week if you've been doing our, our weekly devotion Somebody asked him, said, if you had to do it over again, what would you do different with your life? He said, I would dream bigger because all my dreams have been fulfilled. I dream too small. When I heard that this week, I'm thinking, wow, should we be, be building an 80, 94,000 square foot Sunshine Center? Maybe 47,000 is too little. I mean, just a thought, just a thought, just a dream, just a dream. But what I'm simply saying is, that, that when you and I understand that, that these ambitions, they come from God, are, are, are general, are, 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 are genuine ambitions that God gives us, we make sure that we pursue them with passion. But we just don't let this stuff get a hold of. If everything is stripped away and all you have is God, is he really enough for you? Come on, Pastor Lindsay. That's what he's asking this young rich. Hey, dude, sell everything you've got. Give it away and come on and follow me. Is Jesus enough? No, it wasn't enough. He felt like he needed something else. And he wouldn't let go of that. You follow me? There's some of us in this room, and some of us watching online, North Johnson, Wadita. Hey, listen, the question, God, what are you holding on to right now? What, what, what's got a hold of you to the point God said, I want you to follow me. I want you to pursue me. Listen, right, right, right there, I got I gotta, I'm, I've got them running out of town. What, what's some quick action points? Godly ambition produces incredible power. There's incredible power that comes in our lives when we say, God, I want to pursue what you want me to pursue. I want to I want to be ambitious, but I want to make sure my ambitions are godly. I don't want them selfish. I don't want them worldly. I want them, I want them godly ambition. And there's incredible power. Paul said, I always have been ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was known. So I would not be building on somebody else's foundation. You see, your ambition as a, as, as a business owner, a career person, office, still whatever, whatever your, whatever your career is, your career, that the, how you make your money, how you make your living, listen, th that, that, that career can be infused with power if you ultimately live with a mindset. 
God, I just, I just want to preach the gospel, man. I'm not talking about get on a you know, side with, with a Bible. I'm just saying, God, everybody I connect to, I just want to somehow or another make sure that I introduce them to you, Jesus. You follow me? And, and listen, godly amb- ambition produces that power. You all of a sudden wake up with the reality, I'm not making money so can I have a better lifestyle. I'm making money so I can leave a greater legacy. Can I have an impact in the kingdom? Secondly, godly ambition has a purpose. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal, the prize for which God has called me heavenly in Christ. He, God gives us ambition to empower us to achieve great exploits, to, to, to be able to have this tremendous godly purpose in our life. Mark Twain says, keep away from people who try to belittle your ambition. Small people always do that, but the really great make you feel that you too can become great. I want to be around people that, that, that fans my godly ambitions and say, "Woo, doggy. Man, Pastor Phil, look at you. We was in at an event yesterday, and, and we're PR in full throttle. We're PR in Sunshine Center, and we got our TV there, and we got the fly-through going on, people coming by, several hundred people. There are just a lot of good conversations. And, and what, you know, one couple come by, and they said, hey, said, you know, we, we've, we've never seen anything like that around here. Yeah, yeah, there's not really. Well, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's possible, you know, just kind of. Just kind of, I've never seen churches have that kind of a vision. And, and, you know, I got a cheerleader there with me other than Miss Ron. And Marie steps up and she said, well, you don't know Heartland. Heartland, all kinds. I said, go, go, girl, go, girl. You know? But I, I could just, I could just think kind of, you know, that feeling that they were trying to throw a little water upon the fire, the passion. Because you get me talking about Sunshine Center, I just fire up. And the day, they, they soon left, and Rhonda come over and put a pat on my back. She said, don't worry. She said, it's all good. And then it um, wasn't too long until this gentleman shows up, and he said, what do you got going? I said, well, it's a you know, full throttle bike. No, right here, right here. What is it? I said, this is going to be a sunshine center. So, you know, big multi-complex facility, minister, da-da-da. I went through about a, you know, my three, four-minute elevator speech. He said, wow, I've never seen that before. I said, really? I said, there's going to be one. He said, you mean right in Northwest? I said, right in Valparaiso. Where are you going to build this? Oh, right on the tree. And I told him, oh, yeah, I know where that. Wow, that's amazing. I, really, that's going to? I said, yeah. And he just kept on. And I'm telling him, he was the one who just kind of fan. I said, whoa, doggy, come on, fan the pain. Before he left, he dropped $100 in the bucket. I said, hallelujah. Man had a little money to put behind his mouth. I love that, right? Come on. But listen, what, what, what I'm simply saying is that the godly ambition, it, it, it puts us into that point where we, where we live off of that purpose of our life. And then lastly, godly ambition can deliver incredible payoff. Because ultimately, ultimately we're asking the question the young man had the guts to ask. He just asked, what can I do to inherit eternal life. He wanted eternal life, right? Now, again, it was based on his performance and his possessions, and it was in his head, but it wasn't in his heart. But, but he ultimately wanted what? He wanted, does everybody, listen, you ask anybody, do you want eternal life? And I said, sure, doggy, man, give me that. Listen, there, there's, there's tremendous purpose and payoff in godly ambition, Paul said this, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I kept the faith. Now there's stored for me this crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, he's going to award to me on that day. But not only to me, but also to all who long for his appearing. He's talking about the payoff. What, what are you going to get if you take your godly ambitions or your ambition and you say, God, help me to keep them godly. I surrender them to you. I give them to you. What is the ultimate reward? The ultimate reward is there's going to be eternal life. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. And that's what gives us the motivation. I, you know, I, I love, I'm not a huge historian, but I'll, I'll run across some stuff. I come across Bill Butterfield. Bill Butterfield was a, a Purdue basketball star. Uh, he's a champion 
basketball. He in the, in the uh, National Professional Basketball League, which he played in, he scored 14.8 points per game. I mean, this, this dude was, was, was pretty. He was heir to the famous Butterfield name in Evansville. We pastored just south of Evansville for about 14 years, and I used to hear that name, and I, I didn't know the full story. But Bill Butterfield, they, his, he ended up owning a tri-state athletic club very wealthy, lots of money. He could be hopping from Caribbean island after Caribbean island. He's such an intelligent businessman. But one day, God shows up in his life at a, at a crucial moment in his life when he was looking around at what he had and the stuff that he had and, and not just a better lifestyle but a greater legacy. God started giving him a picture of what he could do to save the lives of unborn children. Now listen, and second to seeing his kids and his grandkids have a real passionate relationship with Jesus Christ, that became Bill's life ambition. How can I spend every day of my life to make sure that another child doesn't die or get aborted in death? And because of that, he put a team together, he assembled, and Evansville, Indiana has been known still for years. He just died in June of 22. Uh, June of this year at the age of 94. Evansville is the strongest right to light city in our nation. And it's the largest city, listen, listen, before, it's the largest city in the U.S. of that size without an abortion clinic. Doesn't have one. Isn't that a, come on, yeah. It started with just one man. Did he have an ambition? Oh, I could, I could have a better lifestyle with the money that and he could. And he, he lived well, but he lived very modest for, for his lifestyle. But he pursued his ambition. And I'm asking the Holy Spirit for that for this church and for us. This is a great church. We have visions. We have, we have ideas and we have thoughts of things that we want to do. You know, we was in Alabama for a few days and um, went down there to check on Rhonda's mom and bring my mom back and on on Wednesday Tuesday I, I got to play a little golf Wednesday I dropped Rhonda off with her mom and I just I kind of going back to some places where we started uh, Pastor Matt may mention in two weeks we celebrate I celebrate 50 years and Rhonda Rhonda and I has only been married 48 years but technically she's put up with me like 60 years or so that we've known each other but I went back to a few places that we was there. We went to her, her dad's cemetery and cleaned off and gave him a face wash and put some flowers out. But I was, I was, I was praying, I was asking God about this Sunshine Center because I want to tell you, I, I love the vision, I love, but I want to tell you, I'll be honest with you, it gets, it gets a little weight-bearing at times. It gets a little heavy. It's a $15 million project. It's uh. It's a huge thing just to go after the culture that we want to go after, the disability families. It's not always easy. We're so blessed in this church right now that we've already got men and women that, that you're signing up to help us. So I know I'm not alone in this, but, but there's times I, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm at an area by myself. I'm just included. And I'm just praying, and I'm just, I'm just asking God. I said, God, maybe, maybe it's going to be your will for me to just kind of tee this thing up for Pastor Matt, and Pastor Matt's going to build it, okay? Just sound like, sound like a great idea to me, you know? Tee it up for Matt, and Matt takes it over, and he, he builds it, and I just, I sit back, and I can applaud, and I say, wow, isn't that all? Matt don't think that's a good idea, but <laughs> then I come to find out Matt's kind of thinking like God does. And I heard God speak to my heart, he said, your one prayer right now has to stay focused on not your will, but my will be done. Yeah. Yeah. My will be done. My will and not his. And I think ultimately, all of our ambitions could come down to that very simple prayer. God, every day as I get up to pursue my job or make money or make connections or whatever, my Lord, I want your will to be dominant in this. If this, if this young, rich ruler who had everything on the outside going for him could have just submitted to that, the end of the story might be different. The Bible says he went away grieved. I got all this stuff. 
Now, some theologians believe there is some hope. Not too long after that, there's a rich ruler that comes to Jesus and asks him about his son that's sick. And Jesus acknowledges his faith. Some say that could be that rich ruler. He had a heart change. I mean, understand, that gives him some hope right there for some of you who's holding on so much stuff. Hello? Others say that this young rich ruler could have been Nicodemus that later on come to Jesus at nighttime because, again, he was a ruler. He had, he had religious, uh, 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 the, uh, the religious prestige of the community, and later on he took what Jesus said, and it didn't, it didn't just walk away from him. It, it just kind of stayed in his heart, and Nicodemus, if you know the story, he comes to him at night and he said, Lord, what can I do? How can I get born again? You follow me? So there is some hope in that. So I want to I leave you with that side of it. But ultimately, that story tells us and shows us that every one of us are brought to that point in our life where we have to say, God, am I willing to totally surrender to you in my life? And do it on a constant basis.